The White House vows to track and target anti-Semitism on campus. We have seen an alarming rise in reported anti-Semitic incidents at schools and on college campuses. Animosity is escalating over the Israel-Hamas war. To the students at Cornell, we're tracking these threats closely. Homeland Security in the U.S. is putting dozens of experts in direct touch with campus security. We must also, without equivocation, denounce Islamophobia. And Canadian schools are also feeling that friction. Absolutely. I think people are taking it out on whoever's in front of them. Deanna Sumanak Johnson breaks down the statements and actions striking fear in some students and how universities are scrambling to get this right. Sana Dalajrami is a Palestinian Canadian university student, and for him, the war in Gaza feels personal. On uh, my mom and dad's side of the family, we've had deaths on both sides. He's here for a pro Palestinian rally organized by the York University Student Unions. He says he was pushed and physically hurt at another campus rally, and that university did little to protect him. York Student Union released a pro Palestinian statement last week. He says it made him feel better. When I saw that statement as a Palestinian student, that was honestly, it felt like the first time I had really seen somebody actually say, Our, we have the right to re exist, we have the right to live. But that statement has angered many. It called the Hamas attack on Israeli civilians resistance efforts that are a direct response to the ongoing and violent occupation of Palestine. This student believes it's York University that has shown a lack of empathy for Palestinians caught in the war. Right away, York denounced the killing of Israeli civilians, but until now, they haven't done so for Palestinian civilians. It makes me feel, as a Palestinian, one, dehumanized, and that they don't value Palestinian lives the same way that they do Israeli lives. York University gave the three major student unions a deadline to retract the statement or face possible removal of official union status. The unions did not budge. It's been tough very frustrating and concerning at the same time. Not 50 meters away from the protest, Jacob Berman, a Jewish student at York, says the university has done what it can to make him feel safe, but that he and other Jewish students feel alarmed by the stance of the student unions. We kind of keep our heads on a swivel. Um, there's often times where students will just come up to us because of it and call us out for it. Um, a few days ago, people were holding an Israeli flag and people walked by and just started calling us terrorists for it. York is not the only institution going through upheaval. From McGill to Concordia to Toronto Metropolitan University, there were protests too. At TMU, a letter signed by about 70 law students prompted some calls for their expulsion. The letter, which has since been removed from the internet, said, We assert that Hamas's attack was a direct result of Israel's 75-year-old systemic campaign to eradicate Palestinians. Words that caused pain to Malka Daniels, a Jewish student at TMU. Um, so their letter was not only filled with misinformation, but just really harmful rhetoric and, very, and was created in very poor taste, unfortunately. Adam Muller is an expert in peace and conflict studies. What we're seeing, I think, is administrators struggling to find the right kind of balance that on the one hand does justice to the suffering of the individuals that we see daily on television and at the same time restrains us enough so that when we express our positions on that suffering, on the conflict, we do so in way that, ways that don't harm other people. It's a balance nobody really knows how to strike at this point. Professor Shannon Day investigates how universities manage academic freedom and free expression. She says universities should tread carefully before imposing harsh punishments on students or organizations. I think that every time there's a rupture in a relationship like this where, um, you know, the university needs to strongly intervene or feels that it needs to strongly intervene, it makes it all the more difficult to have the good, careful, trusting conversations in the future. We um, are going to continue to see these kinds of conflicts on an ongoing basis. York University is moving ahead with a formal process to determine if three student unions breached inclusion rules in their statement. It's something that doesn't sit well with Palestinian students and their allies. I don't feel comfortable properly expressing my, my solidarity with my people, my grief with the massacre that's happening against my people when they're constantly trying to suppress those voices.
as the war thousands of kilometers away made Canadian campuses a land divided. So Deanna, when we talk about university responses, many Jewish students are really unhappy with how their institutions are handling these incidents. Let's talk about that a bit. Absolutely, Adrian. So take Western University, for example. Jewish students put up posters of Israeli hostages held by Hamas. Two young men, presumably students, were seen taking them down, and that video was posted on social media, but nothing really happened as a result. And we've seen similar examples off campus of people taking down similar posters. So this kind of stuff is happening. And lots of people saying they're feeling unsafe. Yeah, that the university is not doing enough. So uh, also, interestingly, looking at the United States, to hear the White House say that they're going to tackle anti-Semitism and Islamophobia on campuses, what's the plan? So the majority of the plan was targeting uh, anti-Semitism specifically. One of the measures they'll do is they're promising a partnership between federal law enforcement and campus law enforcement to track hate speech, for mm -hmm. example. One thing that they're going to do uh, for Islamophobia and anti-Semitism is that they will expedite complaints by students using the help of a federal agency. So those are some of the promises. Just today, Cornell University, of course, a major Ivy League school, uh, started an investigation because there was an online threat of violence against Jewish students posted in an online forum. All right, Deanna, thank you. Thanks. Our investigative unit has been getting some hard facts about a growing online threat. The people behind it are willing to ruin your life. Take a look. Cyber tip analysts are seeing a stark increase in sextortion tips from the public. And experts say social media apps could be doing more. Right now we're averaging about anywhere between eight and 10 um, sextortion incidents per day. Sextortion is the act of threatening to share someone's nude or explicit photos or videos publicly in most cases for money. Hey, I have your nudes and everything enough to destroy you. If you block, I'll have no other choice than to send as I have a screenshot of all your followers. As you can see here, they're actually counting down saying, I didn't care about your life and career bro, 19, 18, 17, 16, all in separate messages, and then escalating the threat. As you can see, the, the victim is really begging with them, like, please stop. The creeping menace of sextortion tomorrow on The Breakdown. Coming up, as one city looks for solutions to a homelessness crisis, not everyone is on board with the plan. So you think the homeless should be helped? Yes. But just not in your neighborhood? No, not in my neighborhood. The real challenges and real divisions in the search for a solution. That's next. Ontario City divided over a novel plan to quell a homelessness crisis. This will be a private room. Wasteful <laughs> money coming your way. Critics say these hubs will spread social problems throughout the city. My kids, they might physically get attacked, I don't know. I've also experienced homelessness as a child. You probably would have been afraid of me back in the day. Nick Purden traveled to London, Ontario, just as City Council was deciding whether to proceed with the first phase of housing vulnerable young people. He breaks down the divide. You got hungry people! You got people on drugs! You have people on your streets! And you're gonna stretch the issue all around London. Homelessness is the top priority in our city. Uh, this mental health addictions and homelessness crisis that we see hold back much of the potential we have. We don't choose homelessness. Homelessness comes. You never think you're gonna, it's gonna happen to you until you get so mentally ill that you can't take care of yourself anymore. There are as many as 35,000 Canadians living on the street every single day. Homeless encampments are now common all across the country. Here in London, Ontario, the situation got so bad that the city's trying something that's never been done before. Could the city of London, Ontario have found a solution to the homelessness crisis? Attention everyone, call to order, all right. It's decision day. After a year of planning, city council is set to vote on a multi-million dollar plan to address London's homelessness crisis. Mayor Josh Morgan pushes hard for it to pass. Yes, this crisis is experienced by literally every community, big and small, across North America. And in the coming months or years, other communities may very well say, let's do what London did. I'm mayor of a city where since 2000, 
200 people have died on our streets, homeless. I think we're at a unique and unprecedented moment in our city's history. We have the opportunity to save lives and change lives. But it's not a slam dunk that London's plan will be approved. Not everyone likes it. In the gallery, there are two camps, the people against it, but people in favor too. Steve Cordes has a lot riding on today. He's one of 200 experts in London who developed a plan. Steve's expertise is in youth homelessness, and he shows me the facility, or hub as they call it, for getting young people off the street. So we actually just entered into the room that a young person will be entering into, into the hub. And keep in mind, they'll be coming straight from homelessness. They'll have been staying in encampments. It'll be a while since they've looked at anything like an indoor sleeping area. In the hub's model, a person experiencing homelessness wouldn't just get a bed, but any of the health services they might need. All along this wall and along a further wall on that way, on the perimeter of the building, wherever there's windows, these are transitional housing rooms. For the young person that last night was sleeping in a tent, tonight they're going to have a private room to sleep in. So right now it's current office, but this will be renovated under the hub model. This will be a private room. And how many youth uh, will live, will, will be able to stay here? Well, there'll be nine youth in a transitional housing that will stay here for an indeterminate amount of time, as long as they need to get them to that next stage in their housing plan, which is a, a home. 600 new housing units are also part of London's plan. This hub is just one of 15 the city hopes to build. That's great idea. But on the day of the vote, it's clear not everyone supports the city's plan. Right outside City Hall, there are people protesting about money. We need to halt the hubs, everybody. Wasteful money coming your way. Jeanette Cameron is angry because she says the plan won't help enough people. There are 2,000 homeless people in London, but the hub plan focuses on the 600 with the highest needs. I don't feel like this is the proper way to go. I think the money should be allocated into a good or great winter plan, and some of the numbers and ideas need to get recrunched and back to the drawing board. The protesters on the street have a voice inside at the meeting. I don't think we can afford to be wrong with this investment of $21 million. And I believe that a good deal today is a good deal tomorrow. That's Councillor Susan Stevenson. Now she wants to delay the plan. She says it's rushed and the city should consider more options. Take a breath, come back with something truly amazing, the very best next step for all Londoners in 2024. Okay, I'm gonna have you pause, Councillor. For those who are here in the gallery, um, we don't clap, we don't cheer, we don't uh, say other things. There are many people with diverse opinions, but we don't do outbursts of either appreciation or, or otherwise. We're in a crisis here, and we will be held accountable, not just at the next election, but next year and the year after. But Councillor Sam Trosau says there's no time to lose because lives are at stake. Since the beginning of 2020, more than 200 unhoused Londoners have died. And I just think delay, for the purpose of delay, is cruel. I think it's really a slap in the face. The reason for the tension is that things are really bad in London. The number of homeless people has gone from 300 to 2,000 since before the pandemic. One of them is Jocelyn. She's 22, homeless, and she tells me what it's like to live in London in the middle of this crisis. You know, what's, what's the hardest part about living the life you live? Society makes me definitely feel like I am going to fail because I am looked down on because I am homeless. And living with something like that is hard. Living with an addiction, a mental health issue, it's hard and it's not fair to judge people for that. Like, yes, we ended up here because of that, but honestly, most of us are trying our best to get better so we can get out of that situation or even just try to make it by so we can live like a normal human being because normal human beings deserve to be able to shower and sleep in a bed. And like, that's the bare minimum of humanity. And what do you hope for? What I hope for? <clears throat> I hope to be okay. Honestly, at the end of the day, it's always my hope that I can make the right decisions to make sure everything works out. For Jocelyn, it's as if her future and others like her is what's being debated at council. It is an informed plan designed to help people. And the reality is not everyone here wants a homeless person as a neighbor. Menzinter Lote is one of more than a thousand people who signed a petition against one of the hubs moving into where they live. What is it that you're afraid of? Safety. 
not safe there. My kids, they might physically get attacked. I don't know. But, uh, they might get physically attacked? Yes. Cars can be broken, houses. So we have to beef up on our security. Uh, we don't feel comfortable with that. So you think the homeless should be helped? Yes. But just not in your neighborhood? Not in that those neighborhoods, no. Not in my neighborhood. But then something unexpected happens. One of the counselors, Elizabeth Peloza, addresses the protesters in the gallery. I, I hear that there's concerns. I have, I have three children too, and I do not live too far from one of the already service providers that are in my area. Um, I've also experienced homelessness as a child, so I come with a different lens to this conversation. Um, you probably would have been afraid of me back in the day, um, living without a home on the back of a pickup truck in a camper. So that's the compassion that I lead with and the leadership I show in my lived experience. So I'm asking for support of these hubs. Thank you. Moments before the final vote, the mayor wants council to know that the stakes here go well beyond London. As mayor, I can tell you cities across Ontario and throughout the country are also watching exactly what we're doing here in this chamber. They're watching, they're studying what we're doing, and they want to see it work. After all the debate, the vote itself takes only a few moments. Closing the vote, motion carries 10 to 4. London's plan passes, but looking at the mayor, you'd never know. I, I, didn't, I never anticipated when we passed this phase of implementation that there would be a standing ovation or applause. I'm not going to celebrate until I see people off the streets, indoors, getting the supports they need. When I see impacts, that's when you'll see me stand up and clap. So, Nick, the plan in this story, it's really ambitious. How did this come together? It actually started with a, with a hunger strike. About a year ago, the homeless outreach workers in London, the people who go out and help the homeless on the street, staged a hunger strike in protest of how bad the situation was. So the city, that got attention. And then a private citizen came forward and donated $25 million wow. to say, can you do something about the homeless issue? So that really got the ball rolling. And I should say that the, the plan they came up with, this isn't a few people sitting in a boardroom. It's all the social service agencies in the city, 200 people who historically haven't always gotten along or seen eye to eye, came together to come up with the HUBS model. So now what? When is the first one being built? How does it roll out? First one will open in December, then two more in the new year, and then 12 more in the planning stage. That's fascinating. I know you'll keep an eye on it. All right, Nick, thank you. Take care, Adrian. Coming up, well, this is one serious Halloween display. We have lots of customers on a daily basis that ask us about, oh my God, I can't believe who, who did this. Meet the master behind the pop art. That's next in our moment. He is a silent guardian, a watchful protector. We are talking, of course, about Batman. He looks out over the aisles in this Kelowna grocery store thanks to the handiwork of Eric Falkenberg. So Eric's been designing and building elaborate constructions made entirely of pop cases for years now. And tonight, just in time for Halloween, his supermarket superhero is our mom. I found the story with Batman, Batman the Joker. It's gone absolutely wild on TikTok. 1.9 million views. Fabulous, I don't know how they do it. Many years ago, they had a contest for Coca-Cola. It was a thousand dollar contest. So I built this big, big polar bear and I won a national contest by accident. And then I just got hooked. Like I did Santa Claus, I did the Grinch, I did the, the Coke truck, I did the polar bear. <laughs> Tuesday night, I won another two Master Merchandise Awards which makes eight in total. This one was Santa and the Grinch. This one was Spider-Man, Spider-Man and Venom. I went to college for civil engineering. Everyone thinks I use this fancy computer program, but no, it's all just pen and pencil, count the boxes and build it. The semi-truck I bid was uh, 5,000 cases, 50 feet long, 13 and a half feet tall. He's quite talented. We have lots of customers on a daily basis that ask us about, oh my God, I can't believe who, who did this. Ah, uh, there's no one really else doing this kind of thing. It's uh, one of a kind. Well, no wonder they're not doing it. It looks really hard. Uh, lots of us were wondering, are those cases full? So the answer to that is no, because that would just not be safe. Um, he is having uh, some thoughts about what he might do for Christmas, but he's not telling. You're just going to have to go there and find out. 
For all of us here at The National, thanks for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime, on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.